and welcome to Orwellian, the podcast dedicated to the essays of George Orwell. By the old Mulmain pagoda, looking lazy at the sea, there's a Burma girl a set in, and I know she thinks on me. When the wind is in the palm trees and the temple bells, they say, come you back, you British soldier, come you back to Mandalay. This is not the Rudyard Kipling podcast, but it is going to be about Rudyard Kipling, because this week, myself, Lewis, and my co-host, Simon, are going to be talking about George Orwell's essay on Rudyard Kipling. Uh, Shall we just start off as we usually do, Simon? How's things? Well, the weather's getting hot, Uh, the Olympics are drawing near, but we're still in a state of emergency, and we've just been discussing that. So we won't waste time on this podcast discussing it more, other than to say we don't think the Olympics should happen. Uh, we just had a nice Indian meal, and now we're drinking some India Pale Ale beer, because we thought it would be quite fitting for today's podcast. Yes, we'll maybe get into the origins of IPA later, but uh, this week we are discussing um, the essay Rudyard Kipling. George Orwell actually wrote a couple of essays about Rudyard Kipling. The first one he wrote in 1936, just after Kipling had died. It was a kind of, not an obituary, more of a sort of tribute. We might refer to that later, but the main essay we've been looking at was published in Horizon in February 1942. Simon, what did you make of this? I I love both essays. They're really interesting. And even it goes beyond Kipling, because of course the topic is Kipling and a lot about his poetry and his prose, but also about who he was as a man and what he represented, or perhaps more pertinently, what people think he represented and what he represents for people. And I'm really interested in the cyclical nature of what people think of empire and various things in the past. So hopefully today we can see where we stand as of 2021 and how it changes throughout time. But before we get into it, in researching this essay, I was was reading a a journal from the 60s uh, where an academic had written an an essay titled Orwell and Kipling. And this is the opening paragraph. Do you mind if I read it out? Please go ahead. So he's talking about them both. He says, one of the greatest of modern British writers was an Englishman who was born in India. He was privately educated in England, did not go to university and returned to the East to work after leaving school. Empire and the relation between those in authority and those under authority became one of the principal themes of his writing, both in journalism and in fiction. He lived by his pen and made a name as an author of strong political convictions. Many of his stories and phrases have embedded themselves in the English language and the consciousness of its users, even of those who have never actually read his work. Both admired and hated in their own life, in his own lifetime, his genius made him a spokesman and a symbol in the great ideological contentions of modern times. And after his death, he was considered not only an important writer, but also a particular embodiment of the character of his country. Well, actually... Not one of the greatest of modern British writers, two of the greatest of modern British writers. Yes, um, you could have been describing, obviously, either Kipling or Mm. Orwell there. Both Anglo-Indians, both very concerned with empire, but both on opposite sides of whether empire was a good thing or not. It's remarkable how on the surface they paralleled each other in, in the trajectory of their lives, other than Orwell died prematurely and then Kipling lived a bit longer but it's not the early years it's remarkable isn't it Mm. so that description was exactly true of both of them. Simon you told me earlier that you had actually never read any Kipling Um, I'm a big Kipling fan actually Simon Simon ask me ask me if I like Kipling do you like Kipling I don't know I've never kippled it's very good (laughs) right that's that out the way Best, best joke in the English language. He does make exceedingly good jokes. Does Lewis. <laughs> that's a pun. It is, it is. <laughs> Put some money in the jar. When I have to say, that's a pun, <laughs> it obviously means it wasn't a great one, doesn't it? <laughs> it's just one step below, oh, by the way, that was a joke. I'd like to begin this, if you don't mind. Please, please go Because, ahead. as we as we've just said, you are a big Kipling fan, and... He's always just kind of passed me by, other than the poem If. And a good 
quote from the first of Orwell's Kipling essays in 1936 was, he says, for my own part, I worshipped Kipling at 13, loathed him at 17, enjoyed him at 20, despised him at 25, and now again rather admire him. So that he would have been about 40 when he said that. Do you think, Simon, there's... Where do you sit in your relationship with Kipling? Um, and has there been any fluctuations in your relationship with Kipling? I think I am more or less where Orwell was at 40. I admire him as a writer, but I do think he's ideologically indefensible. And I think we're going to get into how Orwell felt about Kipling ideologically later. Um, but I think, in a way, Simon, you're kind of more representative of modern British people's relationship with Kipling and his writing, because I think for anyone under the age of about 60, 65, um, all that Kipling means, if he means anything, is if, and that kind of very <laughs> vague, last night of the proms kind of uh, patriotism. Well, my other insight into Kipling was through one of both of our favourite movies. The Man Who Would Be the King. The Man Would Be King. And he, obviously, it's one of his short stories, isn't it, which the movie was based on. But he's in the movie as the as the journalist. And Played by Christopher Plummer, who I believe passed away recently, just earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Rest in peace. As a Kipling fan, how well does, or how accurately do you think that movie portrays Kipling? I think it was a very, very clever to include Kipling in that story because um, we know that Kipling, it, it all starts off with um, the character played by Sean Connery, one of these soldiers who's um, come over the Afghan frontier um, with a story to tell, turning up at a newspaper office in a, some provincial town in India and telling his story to the young Kipling, who was a journalist. And I think it is quite clever to have that conceit because, of course, Kipling, uh, when he returned to India after his education, um, was a journalist and was a very close observer of uh, Anglo-Indian society. He worked for some local newspaper yes, as well, certainly. didn't he? One thing I want to quickly mention, we discussed how we had Indian food, we're drinking India Pale Ale, but in Kipling's time, he could almost be more associated with what, what we today call Pakistan. That's where he grew up, wasn't it? Near Lahore. The Punjab. And a lot of these stories are based on what we would call Pakistan today. So when we say India, we apologise for being very general, because, but we're referring to India as of the time of Kipling. Well, we're referring to British India. Right? Yeah, yeah, the Raj. British yeah. occupied India, yeah. as we might call it these days. But it, it very much is Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan. Kashmir. So, I love Kipling, I love his poems, but I think I came to Kipling in a very different way from Orwell. Why do you think Orwell, why do you think Kipling was so important to Orwell from his youth, Simon? Orwell was born in 1903. 1903, so he first came into contact with Kipling in 1913. So it's before the First World War, before we start to see the British Empire crumble. And he's at Eton. And I'm no, in no doubt in 1913 at Eton, he was being fed Kipling in heavy doses. And it must have had a great impression on him. He was born in India himself, wasn't he? So he probably evoked his early childhood. And there's a sense of adventure in Kipling's work. Like I said, I haven't read it, but I've read about it and I've glanced in and out. There's a sense of adventure, a sense of the Orient, a sense of what's out there, and it must have really captured Orwell's imagination as a child. Not only that, but he mentions in the earlier Kipling essay from 1936, he mentions how for Anglo-Indian families, Kipling was, as Orwell puts it, a household god. Mm -hmm. And uh, Orwell, as you mentioned, came from an Anglo-Indian family. In the later essay from 1942, Orwell mentions that love of Kipling is a very middle class thing and of course the service families who administered the empire were from the up middle to upper middle classes. 
like Orwell himself. So it's obvious that you know Kipling would have been uh, very important to the ideology of people who ran the empire and who wanted to justify running other people's countries for them. So Lewis, with regard, let's let's put both essays together, particularly the second essay in nineteen forty-two. Two. What theme do you want to have a look at first? What should we jump into? I'd quite like to start um, with, I think we should start with one of the early themes in the essay, which is Kipling and his ideology. I don't know if you noticed this, Simon. Let's, let's get this out of the way. Yes. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you noticed this, but this essay was written in response to the publication of a collection of Kipling's works by T.S. Eliot, the very uh, famous modernist poet who you, you would think wouldn't like Kipling, but Eliot actually was a big fan of Kipling. And in his introduction to this book, Eliot was trying to defend Kipling uh, and his subject matter. But Orwell says right at the beginning of the essay, you cannot defend Kipling's ideology. It's indefensible. But you can defend him based on his artistic skill. What did you make of this? Well, what's the, what's the famous quote that, like, what does he call Kipling? I love this. Kipling is a... Fascist. Yeah. And also... Well, Orwell doesn't call him a fascist, he, but he, he says, says that not. left-wing people like to call him a fascist. And that really struck home, because how often are you hearing fascist now? I, I was listening to LBC quite a lot over the last few years, during the Trump reign in America, they were forever referring to him as a fascist. Now, I'm by no means a Trumpian. I didn't like the guy at all, but he's not a fascist. Just people who wanted Brexit are not fascists. I really hate the overuse of the term. And it's good to see that back in 1942, there were people saying this was happening as well. Lack of nuance is not a new thing. Mm. He goes on, uh, Orwell goes on to point out that Kipling, this is a quote, Kipling's outlook is pre-fascist. So um, Kipling, his ideology, even by 1942, when the British Empire was still very much a thing, was completely outdated. So you couldn't defend it. And I think in a way Orwell is saying it's not a dangerous ideology anymore because it's on the wane. Did you stop to think, Simon, about when this essay was published? You know, 1942, what had happened a few months before this essay? Well, the Japanese had it overrun a large section of the British Empire. They had taken Singapore. Uh, they were knocking at the gates of India. Uh, they'd taken Burma. Uh, and as I say, they were knocking at the gates of India, so the British Empire very much looked like it was on the wane at this point. Okay, so in its temporal context, that kind of explains a lot about the essay. Do you think that's what inspired him to write this at this time in 1942, was seeing in the news how a place close to his heart, Burma, had been overrun by the Japanese and... I think it was a combination of, of factors. You, you can't deny that it is significant that this essay was published when no uh, clear thinking person could deny that the British Empire probably wasn't going to last a thousand years. But had he written this in 1946, after the independence of India, do you think it could have been a bit more pertinent? Perhaps. Did he write any essays after the independence of India related to the theme of empire? Uh, he wrote an essay about Gandhi, a sort of biographical essay of Gandhi. Around the time of his assassination? Yes, just okay. after his assassination. Well, Reflections on Gandhi. That'll be an interesting one for the future. By the way, for anyone listening, don't buy tangerine flavoured IPA. Is it not any good? It's rank. <laughs> I'm not enjoying it. I'll drink it, don't get me wrong. But I'm not enjoying it. Anyway. Let's get back to the topic. <laughs> Another thing he says, and this is my favourite line, is Kipling is a jingo imperialist. As a, as a social linguist myself, I really love the term jingoism. Mm. Because it's come back into fashion. 
you watch any speech of any populist leader, which are, which are who are growing around the world at the moment, they're full of jingoism, perhaps even jingo imperialism. This is something I wanted to bring up because I think one of Orwell's arguments is that Kipling's view of empire is so outdated that it's no longer, you can't really take it seriously anymore. But at the moment, the British cabinet in Westminster is full of people who are rather nostalgic about the empire, isn't it, Simon? Boris Johnson is famous for quoting Kipling. And on a visit to India, what he quoted Kipling at every opportunity given to him, which I felt was a little insensitive. Think what you may of Kipling. In India itself, he is associated with their imperialist past and in a ne negative way. And Johnson knew that, or should know that. Well, the famous incident I was thinking of was when he was in Mandalay and he quoted the poem I quoted at the beginning, oh. especially the lines, come you back, you British soldier, come you back to Mandalay. Um, and this man is now our Prime Minister. Yeah. Michael Gove is also a big apologist for Empire. The Scotsman Michael Gove. Do you think we are entering or are in a period of uh, imperial revisionism. You know what I think it is, Simon? Um, did you learn anything about the British Empire in school? I don't think I did. Neither did I. Mm. We were not told about how it came about, we were not told about how it operated, we were not told about uh, how it declined and ended. We were just vaguely aware that our country had once ruled a quarter of the world and didn't anymore. And it was never really explained to us, which I think is one of the reasons why there is so much controversy over the legacy of empire in Britain, because so many people do not understand what the problem is. Um, Orwell hit, says here, um, one of the reasons that Kipling's ideology is so problematic is because, I'm quoting, he could not understand what was happening because he had never had any grasp of the economic forces underlying imperial expansion. It is notable that Kipling does not seem to realise, any more than the average soldier or colonial administrator, that an empire is primarily a money-making concern. Yeah. Imperialism, as he sees it, is a sort of forcible evangelising. Now, I remember a, a, an online conversation I was involved in a couple of years ago, where a guy was saying, why, a, a British guy, was saying, why are we apologising for our empire? Other countries did it. And anyway, wasn't the British Empire a good thing? Because first of all, it spread the English language. And second of all, it opened up opportunities for international business. And, you know, I don't get involved in online arguments because they're, they're just, they're a poor uh, it's a substitute. Well, exactly. It? But I just thought, I thought, I wish I was in the room with this guy, because I just wanted to say, your reasons for thinking the empire was a good thing, is that an excuse for going in with guns to a country and saying, okay, we're in charge now because we have the guns and we are a superior race, because that is what the empire... Why do you want to be in the room with him to say that? <laughs> You're the most peaceful man I know. <laughs> I think... Slap him with a kipper. <laughs> <laughs> with a kipling. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing. In my studies of empire, how people always refer to the militaristic aspects of it and to the cultural aspects of it. Empire is 99.9% .9 about economics and the market. The British Empire was simply an exercise in opening up new markets in this free market system we developed for at, our Navy. At gunpoint, we should point well, out. Gumbo diplomacy, mm. yeah. It's all about markets, opening markets for what we at first produced and then later imported. And then as our own industry started to go into decline and our products were no longer required around the world, guess what? Our empire started to decline. It's, it's very simple. It's, it, and I really appreciated that point, how it's boring to focus on economics and the market, isn't it? 
market liberalism doesn't catch the tongue. Whereas the Boer War, or the Crimean conflict, the charge of a light brigade does. But the particular uh, mark of Kipling's ideology is that he doesn't realise this, according to Orwell, because Kipling belonged to that period, that kind of high imperial period, where people had kind of lost sight, either deliberately or mm. without realising it, they'd lost sight of the economic reasons for empire, and they started to think, we rule the world because we are the greatest, and because we are spreading our superior culture around the world. Because it, it was the third period of empire. So the first and second periods of empire were solely focused on the extraction of resources, and creating markets for the trade of those resources. Whereas in the third period of empire, which could also be called the expansionist phase, is when we started to actually take territory and settle it. And when you start taking territory and settling it, you're subjugating local populations. And when you subjugate a local population, you have to justify it. And the way they justified it was through this form of social Darwinism, of claiming that we were educating, saving these people. And what was the famous Kipling Kiplingism that he came up with to describe this? The white man's burden. They started to see it as our burden to... Our duty. Our duty to bring these people out of barbarianism and into mo modernity. Did you ever get a sort of image when reading this essay, Simon, of Orwell propped up against a bar with a pint of IPA at his elbow saying... Not tangerine booze. <laughs> not this tangerine idea. Good, good honest brown booze. Yeah. Um, and saying, say what you like about Kipling, but... Because I kind of felt that was basically what Orwell was doing in a lot of this essay. Because he does make this point about, you know, how empire is indefensible and Kipling's imperialism is indefensible. But then Orwell does also mention, oh, but if you look at a map of the railways of India yeah. and compare it to a map of the countries Around we haven't colonised. Yeah. Um, well, the one thing he said that he appreciated about Kipling that I could kind of relate to was, I'll put this in layman's terms. He appreciates how Kipling represented those who are making the decisions and not idle opposition. And I've been thinking recently a lot about the decline of the Labour Party, the left in Great Britain. It's in, I don't want to say the word terminal, but drastic decline, which could see a conservative government for the next 20 years. So I've been thinking a lot about that recently. And one of the things I personally, and let me repeat, personally put this down to, is the what I, what I call champagne socialism, where a lot of socialists are happy to win the argument, but they don't actually want to be in a position to put that into practice. It's idle opposition, as Orwell calls it. Like the hard left in the Labour Party, they're too busy fighting about the message without concentrating on being in a position to put the message into practice. That also puts me in mind of what Orwell says about the hypocrisy of those people who criticise Kipling's imperialism, because at the time he was writing this, uh, the British Empire it may have been in decline, but it was still in existence. It, India never fell to the Japanese Imperial Army. And... Um, he writes that those who criticise Kipling, left-wing parties, have internationalist aims, quoting Orwell here, and at the same time, they struggle to keep up a standard of life with which those aims are incompatible. Now, I'm sorry, I'm going to use some rather outdated and objectionable language here, but I'm, I'm quoting Orwell. I forgive you. We all live by robbing Asiatic coolies, and those of us who are enlightened, in inverted commas, all maintain that those coolies ought to be set free, that our standard of living, and hence our enlightenment, depends that the robbery shall continue. Now, that was true when Orwell was writing it in the 40s, and it's really true now, isn't it? Isn't all of us in the West, no matter how woke we are, we're all tapping away on our iPhones, which are made by people living on 
starvation wages, yeah. uh, wearing clothes made by people who are, you know, working in ununionized factories. Sweatshops in Bangladesh. Um, yeah. And what, what's, what do these countries have in common? They were either colonized yeah. or they were exploited. It's amazing, isn't it, the hypocrisy of humanitarians, unaware of their privileged economic state and where it comes from. The reason you're economically privileged is because your parents and their parents work for companies who came into existence and got rich on the back of empire and the practices of empire. It's amazing, isn't it? During the previous podcast, we discussed people going on gap years and working in orphanages. You have to be rich to do that, basically. And they're all rich on the back of an imperial past. And of course, you and I are as guilty as anyone. Um, but the reason we're pointing this out is to say that... Well, and we're also pointing out we're not guilty because we, we haven't gone and subdued a protest in Lucknow. No, no. With our guns. We we're, haven't, no. We're, we're not guilty in that aspect. We're guilty as in... We are, uh, we're guilty in, in that we're, we're part of the whole global economic capitalist system, which you cannot extricate from imperialism and its effects. However, the reason we're pointing this out is to show that Kipling is inescapable. He's part of the landscape, just as imperialism is part of the economic landscape. I think, sorry, go on. I was wondering if, if now we can get into the question of zeitgeist. Yes. So a quote from Orwell, he says, the most one can say is that when he made it the choice, that's Kipling's ideology, it was more forgivable than it would be now. And even more so now, as in our now. Um, to what extent can we call upon Zeitgeist as an excuse? Well, his argument, I believe, is that uh, it's part of his differentiation between imperialism and fascism. His argument is that in the 19th century, they didn't know uh, what imperialism would lead to. Because you can really trace a line, can't you? Between... But they knew what imperialism was doing. Yes, but to them, ideologically, Orwell is saying, to them, ideologically, they believed it was the right thing to do. But of course, that doesn't make an, make an excuse for it. They were forever saying, oh, we built railways, we created a system of governance, we created schools and universities. But was Kipling completely blind to the fact that local, the local populace had by no means gained any economic or social parity throughout the entire time of the British rule of India? I think it was a kind of willful blindness because have, have you, you haven't read the novel Kim. No. Kim... But I saw a movie which, which was based on it. Kim begins with some a, a crowd of Indian people getting onto a train, and uh, there's a Sikh in the, in the crowd, and one of the women who comes from a village is scared of the train because she's never seen one before, and the Sikh says to her, do not be afraid, this train is good, it is the work of the government, meaning, of course, you know, the British government in India. And I think that Kipling's view of things was, yes, there's not parity, but uh, we are still bringing civilization and unlight enlightenment. I, I almost said un unlightenment, that's a Freudian <laughs> slip. Uh, we are bringing, bringing civilization and enlightenment to this country. Now, I'm not defending that, but I think Orwell is saying in this essay that this is what Kipling believed, so at least you can say he was a man of convictions and he thought he was in the right. Well, Adolf Hitler was a man of convictions. He thought he was in the right. Adolf, uh, Joseph Stalin thought he was in the right. He was full of conviction. It's not an excuse, is it? How do you approach this, then, ideologically? I don't give too much credence to zeitgeist. It's too easy, isn't it, to say, well, then they didn't know. It was a different time. It was a different time. I'm sorry, but they did. 
Often we all excuse our grandparents for their racism. <laughs> I mean, a lot of ground we say, oh no, they, you know, when they were young, they didn't know. Grandparents knew it was inhumane to refer to another human being as inferior to them, no matter what time they were born in. Had they never seen a person of colour in their lives before, it doesn't matter. They knew they were another human being, just like they were, born to a mother and one day gifted to the grave. And I must say that I've always been a bit sceptical about the, uh, you know, oh, grandma's racist because she's old sort of thing, because mm. my grandparents in all the time I knew them, never said a single racist thing. And in fact, can I tell a story which, you know, might seem a bit kind of virtue signaling, but it's a family story that's quite, that I've heard a lot. Go ahead. Um, so my grandfather uh, worked for the British government and he was posted to Singapore, uh, which had just gained its independence from Britain. It was the mid 1960s. And uh, he was working on the naval base. There was still a British naval base on Singapore. And as a naval officer on the naval base, he was entitled to an ama, which is a woman who, a local woman, Malay or Chinese, who would look after his children, my mother and my aunties. Mm -hmm. Now, it was... The common practice for Amas to refer to the men who were their employers as master in the mid-1960s in Singapore and refer to the women in who they were in the employ of as men. Oh, Margarita. <laughs> and um, my... Oh, two people will get that joke. My... Well, it's me and my spouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so... My grandfather insisted on being called by his first name. He didn't want to be called Master because he didn't like it and he thought it wasn't right. Um, and I was told that story from a very young age. And that showed me that just because you're born in 1931 doesn't mean that you necessarily grow up thinking you're superior to people with a different okay. colour of skin. That's a really good story, actually, and it goes to prove our point, doesn't it? You know, when um, I lived with my family in Hong Kong in, from 1989 to 1992, we, we had a live-in girl from the Philippines. You know, we're, we're, we're a working-class family from the Midlands of England. We can never imagine we'd have a live-in, I don't know how to say it, I think it was, I think there was a, a colloquial word for it, but let's just say maid. And she lived with us and cooked, cleaned. Looked after me and my brother, and she's from the levy from the Philippines, lovely woman. And everybody had one. So that was clearly a residue of empire, wasn't it? Simon, I wonder if for the final part of this podcast we could talk about the aesthetic aspects of Kipling, because Orwell says you can't defend Kipling on his uh, ideology. But he was a damn fine writer. And he mentions how he is what Orwell called a good, bad poet. What, what did you make of this? I, I love that phrase, a good, bad poet. So does that mean he's good with prose but bad with poetry? No, I think it means he is good as a writer and his poetry and prose are good but his ideology is bad and some of his uh, some of his aesthetics are I bad. see I see well his poetry I know you're a fan and you read to me a few of his poems but he's a bit sentimental isn't he it's true but I think Orwell makes the argument that sentimental isn't necessarily a bad thing he writes here um a good bad poem, quoting Orwell, um, a good bad poem is a graceful monument to the obvious. <laughs> it records in memorable form 
perverse is a mnemonic device, among other things, some emotion which very nearly every human being can share. Now, we were criticising uh, Boris Johnson for uh, quoting Orwell in a, sorry, quoting Kipling in an inappropriate situation. But you have to admit, the, the poem, The Road to Mandalay, it's a beautiful poem, flows beautifully, and it really gives you a sense of place. One of the things uh, I really like in this essay is where Orwell points out that whatever you think about Kipling, his ideology, uh, he is a very important source if you want to know what the British experience of the Raj was. Um, can I quote him here? So Orwell writes, from the body of Kipling's early work, there does seem to emerge a vivid and not seriously misleading picture of the old pre-machine gun army. The sweltering barracks in Gibraltar or Lucknow, the red coats, the pipe clayed belts and the pillbox hats, the beer, the fights, the floggings, the hangings and crucifixions, the bugle calls, the smell of oats and horse piss, the bellowing <laughs> sergeants with foot-long moustaches, the bloody skirmishes, invariably mismanaged, the crowded troop ships, the cholera-stricken camps, the native concubines, the ultimate death in the workhouse. It is a crude, vulgar picture in which a patriotic music hall turn seems to have got mixed up with one of Zola's gorier passages. <laughs> what did you make of that? Is that Emile Zola he's referring to? Yes. Okay. It's great. So can we talk about that, mm -hmm. the militaristic aspect? Because the poems that you've read to me, and it was really nice hearing them and hearing your enthusiasm, like the poem Tommy. What, is, just, what, is, what, is, what is his attachment to the, to the private soldier? Well, you might as well ask me what is my attachment to the right. private soldier, because you're the one who comes from a military family. My family is, is not uh, really connected with the military at all, and yet I love these poems. Mm -hmm. um, I think it has something to do with not the sentimentality but the vividness of the poems and how it really puts you in the moment. These poems make me feel what it must have been like to be a private well, in the in What the Orwell army. appreciates, and this, I liked this, is that he, he understands that Kipling has understood the reality of life for a private soldier. Do you have the quote to hand where he talks about the reality of war when a, when a, a gun is fired? He says something about how the reality is, in war, everybody is, in my terminology, shit scared. And nobody knows what's going on, which we now call the fog of war. And compared to other poets, Kipling got this. Well, we have, uh, it, there's a couple of quotes here. We have, um, at least he knows, that's Kipling, at least he knows that men ordered to attack impossible objectives are dismayed. And yeah. that fourpence a day is not a generous pension. Once more to the breach, my men, means nothing in reality to your average Tommy. Yes, it, again, he says here, what have I done for thee, England, my England, is essentially a middle class query. Yeah. Almost any working man would follow it up immediately with uh, what has England done for me. And that is the thing about uh, Kipling, because he does realise that these fighting men are hard done by because they they're in the army for six years they leave uh, I I read you the poem back to the army again which is yeah. all about how a man leaves the army and is living in poverty and all he can do is go back into the army and I think Orwell would say and I would agree with him the problem with Kipling is that he he deals more with humanity and human experience than he deals with systems if Kipling was like Orwell, he would say there is something wrong with this system that allows a man who has fought for his country to die in the workhouse. But instead of saying that, uh, Kipling writes poems which say, isn't it a great thing that this man is fighting for the empire? And by the way, because he's fighting for the empire, maybe you should give him a slightly more generous well, pension. What people have to realise is Kipling, like Orwell, was impatient with orthodoxy and was, despite being what we could now call a conservative militarist, was not entirely comfortable around authority and systemat systematic authority. 
Now, what I love about Orwell, and from what I learned today, also Kipling, and this is what I've learned as well, speaking to my brother and father, who are both in the army, no soldier fights for the queen. No soldier, soldier even fights for the country, and not even for their officers. They fight for each other, for the comradeship, for a wage and survival. And what's more, in reality, it's the senior NCOs who run the army, the sergeants, the staff sergeants, or colour sergeants, and the warrant officers, not the officers who run the army. Yeah, who are the movie? Who are the movies all about? Like, about the generals. Yeah, yeah, the three feathers, charge of the light brigade, all the movies. Not even, even um, the man who would be king. They're what rank are they? They're, they're just corporals. Oh, they're corporals. Or sergeants. Probably why we like that movie so much because the one which shows the Tommy and what he would get up to given the chance. So yeah, that's the reality, and Orwell sees it from his time fighting in the Spanish Civil War, and Kipling has seen it. I really liked that. What do you think of this idea that um, Kipling, he's very good at human experience, so he can, he can write a poem saying, isn't it a terrible thing that this soldier who's fought for the com this country is out of work, but he's not going to question the system that has left that soldier out of work. What do you make of that? I think he's too, do you not think he's too inter, intertwined with the system? Exactly. The system is his raison d'etre. Orwell says in the essay that the problem with Kipling is that he aligned himself with the powerful and he became part of the establishment and then after the First World War he became embittered and out of touch. Well, there's a, another reason why he was quite embittered after the First World well, War. Well, yes, his, was, his son was yeah. killed. His only son was killed in the, in the First World War. And there is a beautiful poem. If you like poetry, listeners, mm -hmm. look for the poem My Boy Jack, which is just devastating. And it, yeah. I, I remember um, a few years ago on the anniversary of the Battle of the Somme, uh, I, I read that poem just as a kind of quiet tribute to all those who died at the Somme. It, it's a, a beautiful and very devastating poem. Have you ever been to any of the war memorial sites and the graves on the continent? Sadly not. You would love it. They are immaculate and purposely so. They're heavily funded by the French and British governments. They're immaculate. A, a very good testament to those who died. And you know, I didn't know this until today, Kipling. He wrote. He, well, he was the founder mm. or co-founder of that movement, the War Memorial Movement, which created all these grave sites, obviously inspired by his son's death. And another thing I learned, he came up with the term. The Glorious Dead? No, their name liveth forevermore. Uh, yes. Written on every single grave. I didn't know that was Kipling. Well, uh, Orwell points out, I mean, you would think it was from the Bible, wouldn't you? But I Orwell did. points out very early on in the essay that Kipling was very influenced by the, the rhythms and well, the cadence. Well, well the, name, the name, the name, Liver I think, is from the Bible, from the Clusterses. But Kipling was the one who took it and decided it was to be put on all the gravestones. Oh, Lewis, you would love, you would love it. Do you know when I told you I walked across Europe? Mm. I walked through all of those. and Oh, it's... If you don't shed a tear, I'll buy you a thousand pints. I'm very confident you will. They're, 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 and may, think what you want of war, but these were young men who lost their lives in a war which they were probably conscripted into. And they are extremely emotion-evoking testimonies to their love. Well, you say, you know, think what you want of war, but this is one of the reasons I like Kipling, because even though I would describe myself as being on the left, centre left, um, I very much sympathise with and appreciate Kipling's preoccupation with soldiers and their fate and them getting a fair deal. And I think this is a problem with people on the left. Sometimes we don't think about the army uh, because we are natural pacifists yeah. and um, we don't think about the fate of the uniforms who guard us while we sleep, as the poem Tommy puts it. But uh, that's one of the reasons I appreciate Kipling, is because it reminds you the soldier is a human being. The soldier is often let down yeah. by the government they're fighting for. I once did this um, 
you know, I used to be a bicycle adventurer. I once did a trip from Alaska to Argentina. It took me a year. And in doing this trip, I raised money for a charity called Help for Heroes. Do you know them? Yeah. And when I was raising money, this Spanish guy, and to his credit, he said to me, Simon, like, you're a friend and I want to help you, but I'm not comfortable donating to a military charity because the British Army, at this, and especially at the time I did this, you've just marched into Iraq and Afghanistan and caused havoc. And I said, I won't say his name, I said, yes, I completely agree with you, but this charity isn't about government ideologies, government policies. This charity is about young men and women who join the forces because they come from working class families and it's pretty much their only way out. So they join the army. That's been the same for 300 years and it continues now. And they get sent off to these deserts they've never heard of before and some of them don't come back. That's what this charity is for. And those who do come back uh, are left often really badly let down by the government they fought for. And, and shells of their former selves. And left shells of their former selves and not given a decent pension, as yeah. Kipling mentions in his poems. And a lot of lost limbs. They've suffered mental damage. What, what, PTSD, is that it? PTSD. And um, that charity helped them. So that's what the charity was. And I think you're spot on and all else spot on. You have to separate militarism and the reality of working class people who have no or a few other options than to join in at the at the base level of that. I feel the same way every time uh, Poppy Day, Remembrance Day comes along, and there's always the same debate every year about oh, is the poppy a symbol of militarism? No, it's not. It's a symbol of remembrance of people who have died, um, people who often didn't have a choice. Yeah, conscripted. Um, so yes, I agree with you there. But as we end, uh, there's a quote I want to read from his first essay. And then I'll ask you a question afterwards. He said, I, for one, cannot help wishing that I could offer some kind of tribute, a salute of guns, if such a thing were available, to the storyteller, Kipling, who was so important to my childhood. So that's all well. Like, as you say, it was kind of a victory. So my question for you is, who played that role for you? If they haven't already died, or if they were to die, who would you want to have a gun salute for, for shaping your childhood? This is, you always surprise me. Let's stick to writers. Writers. You always surprise me with such difficult questions. Difficult is explain the origins of, of imperialism. Of life. <laughs> um, uh, you tell me yours first. Oh, okay. So for me, I'd say Hemingway. Mm. And to I your have, childhood. Yeah. And I have a very similar relationship to Hemingway that Orwell has to Kipling. So, university years, I loved him, adored him, read everything. Then I started to realise, oh, we're very different people, Hemingway and myself. You're, I, telling, me you were, you're telling me you don't box? <laughs> you're telling me you I, wouldn't shoot a rhino at 500 feet? I definitely wouldn't. I, I, I don't believe in hunting. I think it's a really inhuman inhumane is not the right word, in Adam Lane. Yeah, you've, you've also pursuit. told me your opinion about fishing many times. Oh, God. I, anyway, we won't start on fishing. And I lived in Spain for many years, and I hated bullfighting. I think it should be banned. I don't get it. So, and also this persona, this self-gratifying publicist persona built up about Hemingway, I started to despise. And I, in my mid-twenties, started to hate him. Come my early 30s, I started to realise, wait a minute, I really, I mean, For Whom the Bell Tolls was a wonderful book. Still one of my favourite books. Come on, who am I kidding here? So I've had that fluctuating relationship with Hemingway. And I'm at a set stage now where I can detach myself from him whilst enjoying him. There you go, that's one example. I'm trying to think of a writer I've had a fluctuating relationship with. Um, I would have said Orwell, but I've always loved Orwell, and yeah. I've never not loved Orwell. There's got, there's got to be a writer out there that you have a, who's a good, bad writer, if I may steal from. Well, I wouldn't say... If I may steal from Orwell. I wouldn't say good, bad, but uh, fluctuate, fluctuating relationship, uh, Robert Burns, National Poet of Scotland. Okay. Because um, if you're a Scottish child, 
Robert Burns is ladles down your throat like porridge uh, throughout primary school and in the weeks running up to Burns night you're made to learn his poems off by heart and it's not easy learning 18th century Scottish dialect off by heart. Um, so for a while, I kind of viewed Burns as this thing you just had to get through. But then when I got older, and that's another reason, why are we teaching children the poetry of Burns? Because all of Burns's poetry is about drinking and sex <laughs> and um, disappointment in marriage and... Uh, and about, you know, the beauty of landscape, things children don't know anything about. So when I got to be an adult and I started to listen to the songs that Burns wrote and started to learn more about his life and his political convictions, because he was a radical, big supporter of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, but also a compromised man because, you know, he had to make a an honest crust and he became a, an excise man, like a tax officer, yeah. and people hated him for it. Yeah. Um, and he had, you know, when the French Revolutionary Wars broke out, he turned against France, or at least he had to be seen to, so that he could keep his job. I changed my opinion on Burns completely, and I loved him again, and I still love him, and I will always defend him to the point of, you know, I've nearly gotten in fights with people who say that Burns is... Uh, is twee or uh, irrelevant because um, <laughs> I love his poetry so much. I'm a big poetry fan, can yeah. tell. Um, you, you mentioned T.S. Eliot earlier on. Where do you stand on the modernists? Huxley, Faulkner? Um, I was very. Some people even say Hemingway. I disagree with that. But. I was very into the modernists when I was 18, 19, but as I've gotten older, I've gotten more in. I've gone back to the romantics. I'm the same. I now. In my the age I am now, <laughs> I I find the modernists empty. I, I hate that lack of meaning. I hate that lack of chronology in their writing. But if you think about it, you and I liked modernists when we were eighteen, nineteen. Yeah. And the modernists, what were they all about? They were all about tearing up the rule book. Exactly. Yeah. And now you and I, we're a bit older. We appreciate the we appreciate the things that go on forever. That's why I like Kipling. That's why you like. Uh, things that teach you a bit about history and the, the you human know, You know what happens next? We go from being left wing to <laughs> centre <laughs> in ten more year, ten years more we're um, die hard conservatives. I don't know, maybe, and maybe then we'll die if <laughs> <laughs> we'll die neo fascists. You know what's happening. If know? we're lucky in ten years we might be Lib Dems. Fate worse than death. Um, okay, so that's it everyone. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any thoughts about Rudyard Kipling or Orwell's take on Rudyard Kipling. Or if Kipling Cakes would like to sponsor them. Yeah, yeah indeed, they're exceedingly good. Yeah, yeah. Um, Lem the lemon slice. Oh, that's good. Oh, I like the, the French fancies. Right. You know, oh, the, the pink. With a bit of cream at the oh, top. Oh, yes. Yeah, lovely, nice. lovely. Uh, so, anyway, yeah, pink or tart. open to offers. Um, so, write to us at orwellpod at gmail.com. And before we finish, just let me say, Cities and thrones and powers stand in time's eye, almost as long as flowers which daily die. But as new buds put forth to glad new men, out of the spent and unconsidered earth, the cities rise again. This season's daffodil she never hears, what change, what chance, what chill cut down last year's. But with bold countenance and knowledge small, esteems her seven days continuance to be perpetual. So time that is our kind to all that be, ordains us e'en as blind as bold as she, that in our very death and burial sure, shadow to shadow, well persuaded saith, see how our works endure. Very good, very good. You just made the microphone pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Or well, that ends well. Bye bye for now.